LEAP or LEATS procedures are excisional procedures of the cervix and often these are done because we've found abnormalities on the cervix from the prior colposcopy and pap smear. If by chance you missed the previous episodes, catch up on those first before this episode. Welcome back to the New School OBGYN. My name is Eric Schmidt, I'm a board certified OBGYN and always check where you're getting your information because where you get your information matters. The biopsies that we do during colposcopy are small, as we talked about before, and they're about the size of a crumb. Now, they help us diagnose what's going on, but they don't completely excise the area of the abnormality. And that's where these excisional procedures come in. We're hoping not only to get a better idea of what's going on, but also hopefully alleviate the whole area and take out the whole abnormality in the same process. Whether or not somebody has had high grade changes that might have a higher chance of developing to precancer or cancer in the future, or they have persistent low grade but that sometimes can be an indication too, where someone has a low grade change for years and years down the road. But uh, your doctor is now recommending you have an excisional procedure. Where can we do each of these procedures is a good question because um, LEAP procedure can actually be done in the office and that's most commonly where I do them. It can also be done in the operating room. Uh, for cone biopsies, those are often, they need to be done in the operating room. What goes into that decision? There's a couple different factors we think about, and so whichever your provider is recommending. For the purpose of this video, let's mainly concentrate on the LEAP procedure or LEADS procedure, and this will be done most often, like I said, in the office setting. Let's talk about the different things we can do before the procedure to hopefully make this a better experience. Now, if this is your first time meeting your doctor and they're about to do the LEAP procedure in the office, um, you may want to let them know, hey, uh, exams have been difficult for me in the past. Um, I've had a difficult time with my colposcopy. Could I get something for anxiety prior to the procedure? And so if someone's had difficult exams in the past, um, this could be something you could talk to them about to hopefully make it a better experience. Sometimes we can give medications like lorazepam beforehand and decreases that anxiety for the procedure. Now, often if you do have a medication like this given to you, you will likely need a ride home uh, just to be safe. You could also take ibuprofen beforehand to help a little bit with that cramping um, that can come afterwards and to kind of pre-medicate yourself for the procedure. Okay, so we're on the day of the procedure. Let's talk about how we can familiarize ourselves with what's gonna go on to hopefully decrease that anxiety leading up to this. So you're actually probably gonna be in a very similar room where you had a pap smear colposcopy done in the past. Um, now, what's different a little bit about the LEAP procedure is we are using electricity to make the cuts, and this has a couple benefits. Um, it also um, helps to decrease the uh, bleeding during the procedure, because while it's making the cut, it uh, cauterizes some little blood vessels. Because we're using that electricity, we want to use a special speculum that has a coating on it so that it minimizes any chance, any rare chance that any electricity will get conducted to you or the vaginal walls. Now, because of this, I warn patients, the speculum is a little bit more uncomfortable, but hopefully not by too much. The speculum also has a special channel in it, which we often put a little smoke evacuation um, um, connection to it because when you're using electricity to make a cut and the little cautery that's going on, inevitably there's some vaporization of that. And so this um, gets all of that out of the way, not only so we can see, but also so it doesn't go into anybody's lungs. All right, so we're moving on. And so now what we do is we often paint the cervix with the solution called Lugols. This is an iodine-based solution. If you have an allergy, again, let your doctor know. This helps us to, again, visualize the different areas that might have the abnormality on the cervix along the transformation zone so we can, again, most efficiently get all of the abnormality out. We can also use our prior biopsies as guidance from the colposcopy to, again, get all of the abnormalities out. Now that we know where we're gonna focus our excision, we're moving on to injecting the cervix with local anesthetic. Now, this is often a bupivacaine or a lidocaine and with epinephrine, and we use this to create the anesthesia. And again, often patients do feel a little bit of a poke um, with this, um, but it works quickly and often we inject a couple areas of the cervix to numb the cervix. And after the first or second poke, often you're not feeling anything. I always often warn my patients with injection of the local anesthetic that inevitably some of it does get into the little capillaries of the cervix because there's high density, the blood flow to that area. And so inevitably some does get absorbed and often patients are feeling uh, potential symptoms. Those might include ringing in the ears, might include almost a metallic taste in the mouth. Maybe even someone might feel a little heavy in the chest 
and often these symptoms go away very quickly. Just take deep breaths, breathe, and you can let your doctor know if you're getting really symptomatic and they can slow it down. Um, but yeah, communication um, is key and also knowing that these symptoms happen from injecting the cervix is also very good to know. So now the injection is done, likely the worst part of the procedure is over because often patients are completely numb in the cervix and they don't feel anything from here on out. So now we use the machine to make the cut and this doesn't take too long. And before you know it, the procedure is done. And when we remove that either dime or nickel size portion of the cervix transformation zone uh, to be sent off to pathology and hopefully within a week or so, you know your results in the plan going forward from there. We may even use that same machine to help uh, further cauterize the surgical area so that when you go home, you have minimal to no bleeding. Just like in a colposcopy, we can also put that mustard-like solution called Moncells. It's kind of a silver-based solution that helps to cauterize little blood vessels also. Um, if you do get that, uh, I always warn patients, you might have a little bit of an abnormal discharge for a few days to a week or maybe even two, um, but that is normal and expected. All right, we're moving on to the after the procedure. As far as uh, what to expect afterwards, pain should be minimal. Maybe cramping, um, often controlled with higher doses of NSAIDs like ibuprofen um, or Tylenol, um, but no one should have excruciating pain afterwards. If you do, please contact your doctor. Like I uh, mentioned before, expect a discharge as the cervix is healing or if someone had that Moncell's solution applied to the cervix, you can expect there to be a little bit of a discharge. And then again, this goes on for a few days to potentially one or two weeks. If someone were to have a developing foul smelling discharge, increasing pain, fevers, anything like that, you need to contact your doctor right away or potentially seek sooner help in the emergency or urgent care room. Let's talk about your restrictions afterwards. Now, often after someone has this procedure done, um, I often recommend a light day, some rest, and um, often not any strenuous activity, maybe for a couple days so that so the area may heal. The big thing we recommend though is nothing in the vagina. Often that recommendation is for two to four weeks. Often we're recommending a full four weeks uh, for no sexual activity. I hope that helps to ease some of the concerns when someone is going in, into this procedure because there can be a significant amount of anxiety heading into this and concern and not knowing what exactly is happening uh, to your body. I just wanted to go through some common questions that someone might have in regards to having a leap procedure or a cone biopsy and future pregnancies. First question is, well, how long do I have to wait to try for pregnancy? There is no well-studied time frame, but a good accepted time frame would be, I would try to wait at least three months so the cervix can heal and support um, an early pregnancy. Now there is a chance that um, while we make a cut in the cervix in the canal, when your body's healing, it forms scar tissue. And that scar tissue is again, a little um, dense it doesn't stretch as easily. So someone may have what's called cervical stenosis after this type of procedure. And this is actually pretty rare in uh, reproductive age women. Um, a little more chance of this happening in someone that's after menopause. Um, this shouldn't really impact getting pregnant. Um, and this shouldn't really impact um, a, a labor uh, with pregnancy. Sometimes when we're doing an exam, when someone's in labor, we can feel, oh, they had some scar tissue from a potential uh, excisional procedure in the past. Um, but often this doesn't necessarily cause any labor obstruction. So um, less of a concern usually for this one. Probably the most common question that people have is, will this affect my pregnancy? Will it affect me going into preterm labor or have a preterm birth? And generally the increased risk of that is minimal to none, especially with leap procedure. There's a very low risk that this will impact your pregnancy at all. I hope this helps. I hope this uh, decreases some anxiety regarding these procedures in the future. And if you have any questions, write them down below. We'll hopefully be talking soon and I hope everyone has a great day.